Okay, I think you're going to want to come closer. He's got some little tricky things to show you, okay? Another so one. come on down. Come on down closer if you want to, okay? You might even get up and <coughs> walk to see some things. Come on. Okay, I think we'll officially start part two. And if you have questions here, um, Vino, Dr. Patti likes to say, no one goes home until all your questions are answered. We hope you'll get them in <laughs> within a reasonable limit, but so we will now begin part two, our earth science megafauna and myths. All right, uh, microphone seems to be working. So for megafauna and myths, the neat thing about it is when you look at mammoths, they were big animals all across you know, North America, really big animals. But those in the Ch uh, Channel Islands, which are just off the coast of Los Angeles, off of California, the ones living out in the islands actually got to be relatively small. There isn't a scale there for telling you how long that tusk is, but they were basically like this. You know, this is adults compared to the ones over there. If you don't know how big the original mammoth was, well, if you were standing out there as an adult and one of these walked by, you'd say, wow, that's like bigger than a cow, uh, but smaller than a rhino. You know, it's something out there. And this was the mammoths. Now, some of those on Crete and Cyprus were even smaller. This, is, again, is not an adult, or sorry, not a baby, that is an adult. That was an adult mammoth. They were really relatively small living on the islands. They were still the biggest animal on the islands. But the catch that's funny about elephants when you think about them is what happens if you take away all the muscle, all the flesh? Well, you end up with something like this. Now, if you didn't have the elephant and you had never seen an elephant, what would you do with that? Well, what the Greeks apparently did with it is they made it into a cyclops. So that the opening there for the nostrils actually became the eye. The eyes inside the elephant skull are just a little bit, they're not even these big things in there, they're just a little bit off to the side there, but they're not that evident. So the Greeks apparently made this into cyclops. Now you think that, all right, you know, this legend of Odysseus and from Polymetheus, the blinding of the cyclops, well, it takes place on an island, which makes sense because on the island, these dwarf uh, mammoths actually had skulls that were about what you'd expect for a giant human. You know, they were bigger than a human skull, but they weren't absolutely immense to put things off the scale. So these legends apparently had their roots inside some of the fossil record out there. So another one, this character here. All right, this one is one of my favorite. I told you it was a cave bear. But when they first found these inside caves, and this is a replica of the bones, it's not the original, which is why I'm holding it with one hand. It was the original, uh, I'm, would be on the tray in front of me, glass underneath it, and none of you would be allowed to touch it because it was too fragile. But when they found this, they thought that these were the eyes, big, baleful eyes. Well, the eyes are actually only the small notch in here. All of that space is actually the muscle mass for the jaw. So the jaw muscles were immense on this sort of thing. So this thing had a really good bite. But when you look at this, when they found this, they didn't know what it was. They didn't think it was a cave bear because the cave bears were already extinct. But when you look at it, what do you think it, they'll think this would be? Big baleful eyes, triangular shape, teeth, what do you think? Dragon. dragon, absolutely. You are right. This is the origin of European dragons. They, when you look at the medieval illustrations of European dragons, they aren't immense animals. Tolkien supersized them inside The Hobbit to make the story more interesting. The original dragons were about the size of a horse or the size of a bear because they were actually based upon the fossils they were finding inside the caves. This is also the reason why dragons live in caves. And when you think about it, if you have an animal that flies, why would it bother to crawl into a cave? It should be on top of the mountain or something like that. But it was in the cave because their bones were found in the cave. And the oldest tale inside English literature is uh, Beowulf. And Beowulf, if you read it, well, he meets his end at the jaws of a dragon. But the legend of Beowulf arose along a part of Europe where they had lots of caves and lots of cave bear skeletons within them. So this is a replica of the cave bear up there. Uh, but we also have other legends about this. We had Cadmus and Jason, they both were supposed to sow the teeth of dragons in the field and then warrior race sprang out of the dragon teeth and came up and they had to fight them in order to get the fleece. But the neat thing about it is that that means that these are actually the original dragon teeth. 
So these are real, these are not fake, but these are the real uh, cave bear teeth. They're up here and you can look at them you know, afterwards. But these, how often do you get a chance to touch dragon teeth? I mean, it's just not that common. So these are dragon teeth, and so you can come up and look at those. But the catch is, not all dragons are like European dragons. Chinese dragons are long and, you know, they're like 100 feet long and they're very snake-like inside the body and they live in the sky, they don't live inside caves. Well, the catch is, those are probably based on the remains of sauropod dinosaurs found in China. This is how you can get a vertebrae column that is 100 feet long, snake-like inside shape, and the idea that they live inside the sky, how else are you going to get the bones into the ground? I mean, in the time before people realized how the ground built up and how layer after layer came in, the only thing that made sense is that the dragon was in the sky, died, hit the ground enough that its bones got pushed down into the ground. So Chinese dragons are based upon sauropod dinosaurs. European dragons are based upon cave bear. Well, we also had Indian dragons, and quite often people don't realize the Indian dragons, but the Romans knew about them. So this is Pliny the Elder, one of the Romans, and he said in India they had the largest elephant, but also the largest dragon, which was always at war with the elephants. So it would wrap itself around the elephant, squeeze it, and then when the elephant died, it would be crushed as it fell, and you found their bones together. Well, this, of course, just seems like Romans making up crap again. You know, this doesn't make any sense. You know, they're just making up stories and telling people things. But these Indian dragons had horns. And this is also an art from the Indian dragon. And when you look at this long neck, horn, that sort of shape, it should look sort of familiar to you. Especially if you realize inside India, they had fossil giraffes. They had really elaborate structures on top of their head. And so that these things had all sorts of horns and other things, and if you find the bones of these, this would look like you had a horned uh, dragon out there. And the interesting thing is that the bones of these fossil giraffes are found mixed in with the bones of mammoths and mastodons. So that if you're coming across these old bones, it looks like these two animals died in combat with one another. So these ideas and these stories still have their roots within the past. So regardless of what type of dragons you like, Western European dragons were cave bears, Chinese dragons, sauropods, Indian dragons were giraffes, false giraffes, but no matter what, all of these legends often have their origins within the earth as well. Now another one, this character. If you're a dinosaur person, who is this? Anyone know which one this is? It's called Protoceratops, but it's got a hook beak, everything else. But this isn't the the people who weren't scientists uh, you know, doing this, this is something else. This is probably the origin of the griffin. And so the idea of a griffin, when you look at griffins, the tales that the Greeks came up with on griffins didn't arise until after the Greeks had trade routes through the Altai Mountains. So when they moved through the Altai Mountains, they started doing this. And inside deposits in the Altai Mountains, you find the remains of these protoceratops. They're white bones inside red sediment. They stand out really well. But you have an eagle beak, but yet the paws of a lion. Four limbs, eagle beak, it's not a good combination to have together normally inside most animals you think of, but it's also only wolf size. Griffins aren't immense. Now if you're going to make up a monster, why not make up a big monster? The fact that they only had the monster be about the size of a wolf almost suggests that it's got to be based upon something inside evidence. It had a long tail, really big massive tail, which is something that lions don't have on it, and it laid eggs. And all these things match up to what the protoceratops was doing out there. So our griffins there are probably actually really protoceratops remains. And so the legends of the griffins are coming from these fossil remains of protoceratops. The other thing the griffins did is they start guarded gold. Well, there are gold in the Altai Mountains, and so these bones are found out inside an area with gold. The griffins supposedly burrowed underground. Again, this is a way of trying to explain how bones can actually get in the dirt. How can they be buried inside the dirt? Well, if the animal's burrowing, that might be a possibility. But the other line of evidence that suggests this may be the origin of this is when you look at the hero legends of Greeks, things like you know, Achilles, uh, Hercules, all these other characters, there are none that have anything to do with griffins, which is telling you that the legends are actually older than the tales and the knowledge of griffins. So it's not something that they had from the distant past, it's something that's coming into their society after they established trade routes inside a different area. 
Now, the only confusion is that when they described griffins, they didn't know what to do with this frill at the back. The frill at the back was actually an area where the jaw muscle was attached to to give these animals a really powerful bite, and it was also an area where they could shed heat off. And so you could pump blood out into the frill and get rid of excess body heat. But the Greeks didn't know what to do with this as they found it. So inside some reports, they say that it was, had uh, long wings. In other reports, they said it had long ears because they didn't really know what to do with that frill out there. It's unlikely any living animal. Now, there is an alternative. There are some people that pointed out that some things that look sort of like griffins uh, are found inside older uh, records that are older than the Greek legends from further east. So the, our argument might be that the Greeks uh, were just simply finding out other legends from other people and bringing it in. Now, the thing I don't like about that is that actually when the Greek writers are on this, unlike all the other animals that they talk about that lived in the past, the Greek writers refer to griffins as living creatures that are out there. They give the behavior of them. They tell about the nests of them. They think that they were just out there. And these bones out inside this area around the Altai Mountains, the bones are pristine. It's not like most dinosaur deposits where the bones are broken up and they're old and they're mineralized or anything else. These bones were beautifully preserved and they look like they're just the animals of an, you know, the bones of an animal that just died. So most likely the griffins actually had their origin with protoceratops. Now what else do we have? Uh, well, they're not the only ones in the Mediterranean that owe their roots to megafauna fossils. We have large fossil bones found on the island of Samos off the coastline up there. Sorry, get out of the way. And those were identified as being the bones of elephants that were fighting with the forces of the Dionysus against the Amazons on it. But in the area where this battle supposedly took place, you find all these big fossil bones. And so, of course, the battle didn't really take place. We didn't have Amazons and gods fighting one another out there. But the people had the bones there, and they actually started to try and figure out, come up with what those bones must represent. Uh, some of them thought that they were remains of a race of giant monsters called the Neads out there, but these are pretty impressive bones inside this area, and you find these bones inside just bone beds out there. It wasn't just the megafauna, though. These are actually bivalves. They're just seashells, you know, big seashells on it, but they sort of look like they have a hoof shape on it, especially inside cross-section when you find these within the rock. Well, if you're looking at this, what do you think people could come up with this? Well, centaurs would be a good possibility. They actually didn't take centaurs on it. They thought it was instead the hooves of these giant cattle that Hercules stole. But it would be just as good for centaurs because they look like they're hooves, but they're not. They're actually just plesopods. They're seashells. They're in the rock, but they have this distinctive hoof shape, and the people came up with good stories. I'm sure inside some parts, they probably did have them be the hoof prints of centaurs going through. In this particular area, they were just doing this because they had the story of Hercules had stolen these giant cattle. But there you see the footprints of the giant cattle out in the rock. The Numulites are just little forams that are live inside the you know, that are found in the limestone. So they lived a long time ago, about 12 million years ago, but the limestone was quarried out and you still find these things. And they were identified as the remains of builders' meals, of lentil beans or of the bread that the builders that built the pyramids, all the way up into the Middle Ages. People thought that these things were that. They're not. They're just simply marine plankton out there. But we also had this thing called the giant. I, however you want to pronounce it, I'm not very good at it. But uh, this is a battle between the gods and the giants. And this is very common inside Greek mythology and the Romans did it as well. But they also identified where the battlefields were. So this battle took place between the gods and the giants. And every single one of the battlefield locations is actually where we find fossil bone beds now of these megafauna out there. So they thought they had evidence of what they were seeing. So these legends were based upon the fossil record. Now, the legends of giants, you know, based on megafauna, it's not just Greek, not just Roman, it's not just the Mediterranean on it. Uh, when the Spanish conquistadors came to Mexico and to South America, they actually found that the Incas and the uh, uh, Aztecs had fossil bones that they had collected. And they interpreted them to be the remains of giant people. So they thought there was a race of giants that lived in the land. In their mythology down there, there were four ages. And the original age was the age of giants. And then there were three ages of primitive people. And then there was the present age coming in. But they thought they had the fossils of the original giants that lived in the land at that time. 
Now, it wasn't just South America and Mexico that was doing this, but all across North America as well. You had the Indian tribes knew about these bones. They collected the bones. They traded the bones. Uh, but in this case, in northern cultures, for the most part, they recognized them as giant animals. They came much closer to what we would now say was the correct thing. They believed that these were big animals that had died out before modern humans came into the area. But they were monster animals that they had within their own legends and tales at that time. But of course, besides giants, we also had gods. And for Egyptian, if we go back to Egypt, we have the tale of Isis and Osiris. And Osiris was the good god who was murdered by Set. And so Set was the bad god. He dismembered Osi Osiris, scattered his bones all across, and Osiris's wife and sister, Isis, Egyptians did things when their gods did things differently in those days. Uh, but Isis gathered all those bones back together to bring Osiris back to life but she specifically gathered those bones from one valley in Egypt, this valley, the Afayim Desert in Egypt, which has the remains of huge whale fossils out there. So these are the skeletons of fossil whales that are out on the ground, but they thought they were the bones of Osiris that had been brought in together. And for those of you who like the dark side, the Set worshippers had their own set of bones that they thought were Set's bones. And they were found in archeological expedition, they were wrapped up inside this material. When you take them apart, they're nice, beautiful black bones, and they thought, well, black was coming for Seth, but these were Seth's bones out there. It turns out they actually were fossil hippopotamus bones, not quite the same thing. But again, the important thing is that the tales of the gods and the tales we're doing with the monsters quite often had their roots inside the fossil record of these different areas. We have something called the Monster of Troy. It was an ancient legend all the way back in the 8th century BC when Homer first wrote it down. So it's a very, very old legend on it. And in Hollywood, they've done this in a rather bad movie. This was the monster coming out of the water. Uh, it actually, in the original tale, it wasn't coming from the water, it was coming from the land. But a monster appeared out along the coast of Troy after a flood, and the king's daughter was sent out as a sacrifice. Now the interesting thing is, right after a flood occurred is when the monster showed up. Hercules fortunately arrived in time to kill the monster. So this is shown inside 1965 movie, but this is the earliest depiction of the monster of Troy. And when you look at it, that's just a fossil skull coming out of an outcrop after a flood. And this is when many of these big bones are exposed, is after flood events, you wash away a lot of the sediment and you expose these big bones. But that painting and drawing uh, from the sixth century BC of the monster of Troy, it really looks like it's just a fossil skull coming out especially since in this area along the coast where Troy was, we again had these fossil giraffes. And so the skull of the giraffe looks very much like the skull of the monster of Troy, and having the monster of Troy show up just after a flood makes a lot of sense as far as a fossil being exposed just after a flood event. In the temple of Hera on Samos again, in the middle of this temple, it's at the bottom of it, they had actually placed large bones and large fossil bones that were basically being venerated within these Greek and Roman temples. And so they had these things in there. But the neat thing about it, or one of the neat things about the fossil record, is it's not always just the big animals that are involved. So it's not all of these things are tied to big animals. One of the oldest ones are these sea urchins. And I've got a bunch of them up here in front. But these are fossil sea urchins. And oddly enough, they seem to have been collected all over Eurasia. They were collected, they were drilled out, they were kept, and we don't know why. We are not exactly sure why. But something was going on. We have no idea why these things were collected. Part of it may be because they are common across many Eurasian areas, uh, but part of it also might be five-fold symmetry. You've got a rock with five-fold symmetry. In nature, five-fold symmetry is very, very rare. And there are people who have been studying this and now are arguing, well, actually, these fossil echinoids may be the origin of the five-pointed star. Because a six-pointed star is easy. It's just two triangles overlapping. There's lots of ways you do that. Why would you come up with a five-pointed star? There is nothing in nature that is a five-pointed star. Uh, but the only thing that comes close is this sort of symmetry, and these things were collected everywhere. And they meant something to people. This is a large burial mound. This one happens to be inside Wales. There was one in France that no longer exists because they tore it apart to look through it. But there's a burial mound inside France that was 20 meters wide. And it was built, and in the interior, it had one big chamber. And in this chamber, there was a small box about a foot wide that was made out of six slabs of slate. 
And when they opened it up, all it contained and all this whole burial mound was built to hold one fossil urchin. We have no idea what it meant to the people, but it obviously meant something to them. In the more recent times, we have had these things that people thought, well, they warded off evil, they brought good luck or something else, but we're not exactly sure. It meant more than that. I mean, if you're going to build a burial chamber for a fossil sea urchin, that's a lot of work with a lot of people. It's got to mean more than just sort of like good luck, you know, or something else in it, and they buried it there. And here we find a Neolithic burial that was found in 1933, but it's from a long time before. But here you have a burial out there, and right by it is a fossil sea urchin. They buried a fossil sea urchin with the burial. Now, some of you might think, all right, well, there's other stones out there. Maybe it just got knocked in by mistake. But what we find is that there is this 4,000-year-old burial also inside England of a mother and a child and the mourning family, uh, put them embraced, you know, in death, they put them in embraced with one another, and then they surrounded it with hundreds and hundreds of fossil sea urchins. So they gathered these from all over and collected them and put them around their, the graves of their young ones. And this is a church inside England that this was rebuilt in the 19th century, but the windows come from the 13th century church. And again, fossil sea urchins all around the windows. And apparently, when this church was first built, the people who lived in this area didn't have a lot of faith that Christianity was a new idea, maybe it was going to work, but maybe we better hedge our bets and make sure that the windows are all you know, lined with the fossil sea urchins that their ancestors had relied on as well. But these things, this has been going on for a very long time. This is a fossil sea urchin that was found inside Jordan. It's a much older fossil, but it was drilled 9,000 years ago. So 9,000 years ago, someone drilled this to make it a pendant to wear it. Again, we don't know why they were doing this, but it meant something to these people at the time. And this wasn't even the oldest. We find these going back in archaeological sites up to 35,000 years ago. We find fossil sea urchins that were basically collected, used, uh, kept, uh, and drilled for a pendant. And what makes it even more interesting is we find this hand axe 400,000 years ago by a different subspecies of humans, and right in it, they're making it out of chert that has a fossil sea urchin within us. So this actually raises the possibility that our species' interest in fossil sea urchins is actually older than our species, and that's sort of staggering to think about on us. Uh, but the next time that you see a five-pointed star, realize, well, actually, this may be a symbol that goes back a whole lot further than you actually thought. But this is such something that so much of our legends, so much of our stories actually have their roots even within the fossil record. So if you want to come up, you can pet a dragon. Uh, the teeth are real. The dragon skull is a replica. The fossil urchins are all real. If you can figure out what our ancestors thought about them, more power to you. I don't know, but I, what I can tell you is that they meant something really important to the people who collected these. But any questions? Yeah, there's uh, three cheek teeth up here and two canines for the cave bear, five of the urchins, well, four urchins and one sand dollar. But. Yeah. They're part of this group. And so they're part of the same phylum that have fivefold. So star, fish, but the catch is that the starfish and the sea stars are only found along the coastline. And these stars and these symbols show up across the whole landscape. So it seems that they're probably more likely that they're actually tied to the fossil ones that are being collected than to the living ones that are out there. Because we see the five-pointed uh, five stars show up inside cultures that are far removed from the ocean. So they never would have seen a starfish or a sea star at all. So it seems to be tied to something else instead. But they're all part of the same phylum. They're, same, they're relatives of these things here, which is why it's the only phylum that has five-fold symmetry. No other animal has five-fold symmetry. So it's really bizarre why they are, but uh, you can't prove that the stars came from that. Uh, but at least, you know, it seems likely that this is a possibility. Well, these sea stars, like, uh, they're part of Echinodermata, right? They're what? Echinodermata. 
Yeah. And then our, our, our land animals also like land animals like having psychosmetry also part of the genetics? I don't think we have any land animals, do we, that are land animals that are five? I don't think so. But the, these are in Kaido yeah. Those shells, where they found along the They're found along the, no, they're found uh, along in the land. Mm -hmm. But the catch is they used to, they're found in deposits that were marine deposits. Oh. So they were originally marine deposits, but they're now found in the middle of the landscape. Oh. Thank yeah. you. Can I have a question? Sure. You know, uh, centaurs, he was saying that those uh, shells, print imprints, look like centaurs. But mm -hmm. were they, did, did those beetles, I'm sorry, what were they, beetles? Uh, uh, the red beetles, which had made you look like they had hooks and the Oh, those, yeah, the plexipods, yeah. Plexipods. So did they, were there pairs of them, of them or did they have a... Uh, no, those are just separate by themselves. Together or something like no, that. Just Why would they come up with two hoofs? Oh, they didn't have two hoofs. They just had a whole number of what they thought were hoof impressions, but they weren't uh, tying it in. But if you look at like cattle move through, you just get a maze of all these different hoof prints. And so they thought that's what they were seeing there, instead of just seeing a maze of them. But they didn't live in patterns. They weren't uh, two of them bound together. But they just look sort of like hooves for people I to I wonder if them. they were uh, of the species, like the, the, there was a, some sort of crab species they flew across together. Oh, no, these didn't do that. They didn't no. have that habitat. No. Um, okay. Why do you think the um, like sea urchin like fossil matter, matter to the I don't know why. I mean, I honestly don't have a clue, but it meant, it meant something important. If you're going to build a whole burial mound just to, for one fossil, if you're going to collect hundreds of fossils and put them around the grave of your family member, it's got to mean something to you, but I don't know what they are. So your guess is as good as mine, but it meant something important to these people. They thought that they had some power, something that was important. Question about the about the uh, the, the sea star thing. Mm -hmm. um, when I was touching them, I noticed that at the ends of around the stars, they had kind of little little lines that you can see still. Um, I mean, the, I, the collections of these things are well before the 